everybody. My, my name is Dr. Imogen Diel. I am the Programme Coordinator for the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership, and I am delighted to be opening this event tonight uh, where Professor Wendy Lauer will be in conversation with Dr. Christine Schmidt, discussing her new book, The Ravine, A Family, A Photograph, A Holocaust Massacre Revealed. My job very briefly is to go through some housekeeping. So firstly, you'll see that your microphones are muted. Uh, we will be taking questions via the chat feature only. So please do feel free to pop in any questions or comments you have. And these will be addressed uh, mostly towards the end of the session. You will also see that we have closed captioning, automatic closed captioning on for purposes of accessibility. And the transcript will be available for anyone who would like a copy afterwards. This event is being recorded. Um, if you have your camera on, don't worry, only the speakers' cameras will be shown uh, whilst they're speaking, but feel free to, to turn your camera off you would, if you would prefer. And the email, an email will be sent round with the link to the YouTube recording, um, particularly for those who have registered but cannot attend this live event. In that email, we will also have a post-event survey. It would be great if you have five minutes to fill this out. The, this event is being hosted by the Wiener Holocaust Library, which is a partner, one of the partners of the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership. We're still quite a new initiative, so we'd love to hear your feedback on our events, um, things that have gone well, things that could be improved, and which other events you'd like to see in the future. One thing that we're going to be trialing this evening as part of our commitment to bridging the gap between academic knowledge and more public knowledge and understanding of the Holocaust and genocide is to use key terms and references and give some explanation to these and also some links. So I'll be posting those in the chat as they come up. These will also be available on the description of the YouTube video um, afterwards when it's been uploaded. And finally, just to say, to find out more about the partnership, our activities and our events, please do visit our website. I will post the link again in the chat. Uh, it is hgrp.org.uk. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers. So we have Professor Wendy Lauer, who is the John K. Roth Professor of History and Director of the Magrublian Center for Human Rights at Claremont McKenna College. She chairs the academic committee of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Her research and teaching focus on the history of genocide, the Holocaust and human rights. Professor Lauer is the author of Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and has been translated into 23 languages. She will be in conversation with my colleague, Dr. Christine Schmidt, who is deputy director and head of research at the Wiener Holocaust Library in London, where she oversees academic outreach and programming. She earned her doctorate in history from Clark University in 2003. Her research has focused on the history of the International Tracing Service and early tracing efforts in Britain, post-war research and collection initiatives, the concentration camp system in Nazi Germany, and comparative studies of collaboration and resistance in France and Hungary. So without further ado, I will hand over to Christine. Thanks Imogen, and of course, thanks to everyone for joining us and of course, special thanks to Wendy uh, for being in conversation. I'm really honored to be able to have this conversation with you. And first, I just wanted to congratulate you on this extraordinary and incredibly moving book. Um, there, I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions. So I thought we could just dive right in. Um, your book examines in minute detail, the history of a mass shooting of Jews in Europol, uh, now Ukraine and you recreated this through a, a forensic examination of a single photograph, um, which perhaps needless to say is horrific, um, essentially capturing genocide being committed in the act. So I wanted to start with a question, how, you, how did you come to this topic and why did you decide to write a book on it? Hmm. Uh, I'd like to answer that by actually showing the photograph because I think that part of the argument is the power of the image <clears throat> and even the ethical kind of response to these kinds of images that I think um, should occur as far as not just passing over them, not um, buying into the idea that we're desensitizing over time to these, this kind of imagery, but to become more kind of literate and to, to use these images as sources and as um, the beginning of a discovery process um, and a search. So um, I'd like to show the image. Uh, and as you mentioned, it's, it's rather um, disturbing. Um, that's the point in many ways. We're talking about genocide. 
uh, we're talking about the Holocaust, and it is the kind of penultimate, it is the um, the lengths to which genocide go is, I believe, um, pictured in this, in this very image. So if you'll just bear with me, I'm gonna share my screen. We all know the routine here, the, <laughs> the way this works. Um, and I will pop this up. There's my desktop, a little crowded. And um, hold on, move this around. Okay, right from the start here. <clears throat> all right. So here's the image that came to my attention for the first time in 2009. It's something, it's an image that had been locked in the archives in Prague for decades, uh, had not seen the, the, the light of day, um, and just really so striking in so many ways. I think whether or not you're a researcher in this field or even know the history, just coming across an image in which you can see a family or at least a mother and child at first at first glance um, at the moment of murder being killed by these men in this kind of gang formation. So um, two journalists came to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in August 2009. And what's typical at a place like the museum in Washington and probably the same for your institution in London is that those who are conducting research or continuing to search um, in this history will come to these institutions um, and bring this material and seek information. Uh, I happened to be in the archives that day. I wasn't actually living in, in Washington, although I had been living there for 17 years. At the time I lived in Germany and had come back to work on another case about uh, pursuing a perpetrator who was still alive, an SS officer. Um, so I happened to be there. And my um, colleague who works on Ukraine, and I worked on Ukraine for years, um, came up to me at the microfilm reader and said, Wendy, you, you need to, I think you would be interested in seeing this, this, this photograph. This photograph was taken October 13th, 1941. This is the information we had to start with. Uh, it was taken in a town called Mirapol, Mirapol, Ukraine. Um, it was taken by a Slovakian photographer. Um, and that's the extent of, of what we had. And we had some testimony that the photographer had given about the image in 1958, which I will discuss in a moment. But um, for those of you who are looking at this now for the first time, you know, it's very shocking, but I, I, I would imagine that you would also have some similar kinds of responses and feel free to write in the chat what you think you're seeing and what, what questions arise as you look at this image. Um, for me, I was taken by the shoes in the foreground. Um, there's so much that we talk about in the history of absence and the history of memorialization and the way it is displayed um, and, and trauma um, and the resonance of that through these kinds of material objects that, that become metaphors, become kind of symbols of those who are not, no longer with us, um, who were victims of the Holocaust. And the fact that they're here in the foreground with these kinds of papers. And if you zoom in, you know, we have the advent of digital um, technology now. So I could look and see that there were bullet casings kind of strewn, the litter of mass murder, if you want to call it, around the, the pit. The fact that it's in broad daylight, that the light is passing through these trees, and that's the camera, the aperture is open, is capturing this light from that moment. Um, and this is representative of what we know of as the Holocaust by bullet. So these open air mass shootings, the mass murder that occurred outside the camp system, the killing centers of Auschwitz, Birkenau, Tremblinka, Sobibor, what have you, those gassing facilities um, that murdered about half the victims um, and seeing this, this uh, view of the, the trees um, raises a lot of questions as far as what about those who were killed outside those facilities in the edge of their own hometowns and how are they accounted for in the history and what more can we discover? And the fact that it's occurring in these settings, these, that the geography really matters, not only um, the environmental history and what it does to the topography of these local towns, but that the history remains in these local communities in that way. Um, that the, the, the killing itself, there's is a digging up the pits, using nature, putting nature to work, whether it's ravines or, or marshlands or, um, uh, 
you know, with the Nazis were very deliberate in, in making the most of, of what was available to them as they stormed into these towns and carried out these massacres very rapidly starting in the summer of 1941. Um, and so here it looks like a ravine. The book is titled The Ravine and there was a ravine in this town, um, which we can talk about later. But I did come to find out that this actually had been a pit that was dug um, by the victims and also by uh, members of the local community, including um, young you know, girls for requisition to do that. But it's changing the landscape. And we know a lot about environmental history. It's another field um, that has been developing over the past decades. And, and to what extent can Holocaust history um, and uh, research um, uh, that we have been doing in this field intersect with some of the advances in environmental history and the use of, of nature here. And of course, the um, visible uh, collaboration that you have an onlooker here, you have the Germans in their uniforms with their shiny caps, their visors. We can see their insignia. We can start to do detective work there and look at the markings and try to figure out what unit was there. Is it order police? Is it regular? Are they regular soldiers? Um, and try to use the Nazi documentation to identify those perpetrators. They're standing next to these Ukrainians, shoulder to shoulder. So this is clearly an act of collaboration, not only an act of murder, but an act of collaboration. And it is indeed an action shot in the worst sense of the, of, of the, of the concept, because we see the smoke here that is uh, rising above the victim's head and this halo formation, haloing kind of effect, um, which, which means that you know ballistics is part of the story here. Um, and that's the kind of crime scene detective work um, that is part of how we um, do this research. When we talk about genocide and the Holocaust, we're effectively talking about a, a massive crime. So we can employ some of these tools as well. Um, and absolutely um, really struck by the family, the, the image here of the mother or the woman bending over like this, holding the little boy's hand, the barefooted boy. She's got this polka dotted dress, her Mary Jane shoes. Um, and she's trying to protect that child. I, I eventually would look at this more closely with um, zooming in and zooming out um, and actually obtaining um, more of the prints in the archives and um, could, could make out the trace of a child here. And so looking very closely at this image, um, was also resulted in the discovery of, of another victim there in the center of the image. And what does this mean for this family? This is not how they wanted to be portrayed the last moments of their lives. Um, but so what is experience of a family in genocide? To what extent do the genocide heirs focus on the family unit as a kind of ultimate biological root and branch destruction? So these were some of the uh, things that came to my mind as I looked at this and studied this over time. And in fact, the chapters of the book are kind of organized around some of these themes. Thank you. Um, so the, just even how you've presented this now, you know, sort of strongly engages with this debate about looking um, at atrocity photography or looking at the suffering of others in photography. And as you, as you talk about in your book, and in, in obviously your book really effectively engages with Susan Sontag's um, argument about this, um, that, it, that it potentially breeds apathy or desensitization. Um, and then your book also situates uh, this within the history of the advance, advancement of um, technology in photography. So this democratization, you know, through the use of, of portable cameras, the Leica in 1925 and the, the Zeiss icon, which was what I think you, you mentioned was used in this case. Um, when you set out to research this photograph and to do this, had, had you already formulated views about the purpose and role of photography as witness or evidence to the Holocaust and genocide and you know, how one should look at these or about the ethics of, of looking and did it change your views at all or strengthen them? Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually ended up reading quite a bit of literature that you referred to. So Susan Zontag, of course, her famous essays on photography in which she points out this um, potential for desensitization. She's also very critical of the photographer, those who take these images as basically that snapping of the camera as an act of non-intervention. So she kind of you know, morally judges um, in, in some ways indicts the, the photographer for not going in to rescue the victims, but standing back and even using the camera, the, the, the lens as kind of a filter um, of a way of distancing oneself from the image. 
um, kind of impugning the photographer in that in that way. And, there, and there's a reason for that because of her own encounter with the the, the these types of images in her own his, her own experience directly in in the 1990s with the wars in former Yugoslavia. And so it's a it's a fantastic book, and I highly recommend it. And she followed up that book with another one in which she retreated a bit on the argument about desensitization because um, she did face some um, criticism for you know on that. Um, part of it. Um, but I, and, and then there were studies by um, uh, colleagues who argued, you know, one called choose not to look, like that we shouldn't look at those images such as the one that I just showed you because it is denigrating the victims um, further. And that's not how they would want to be pictured. That's not how you would want your grandmother um, to be portrayed in, in, in mass media or on display in museums. And so I was very intrigued by, by this um, kind of ethical dilemma and the discussion over these images, um, which weren't going to go away per se, which were proliferating um, in social media, not only in the Holocaust imagery, these iconic images, but in all um, kinds of uh, events of, of mass atrocities um, in, in our own lifetimes. Even thinking about how much, even though it's not an atrocity image, but the image of that little boy, Alan Curry, the Syrian boy who washed up on the Turkish beach of Bodrum, or you know, in our own history, the, the the little girl running from the napalm attack in Vietnam, and and so we live, we we kind of, and the and of course in Holocaust imagery, the the bones from Bergen Belsen, these are these are not going to go away. These images, they they are, as Hannah Arendt said, kind of with Holocaust images, instances of kind of truth. They, they contain those hard realities. And uh, yes, what do we do with them? We deal with them very carefully. We, I, I argue, we have to figure out what's going on. We have to investigate them. Um, isn't it incumbent on us, even for those victims to try to restore their individuality? Um, we cannot, you know, uh, in displaying them without doing that, um, we are, in fact, I think, being um, irresponsible. But to even to make that attempt and to, to pursue that is an act of memorialization. And in the act, you discover so much, as I did in this photograph, that in fact the the image is one of resistance and collaboration. The collaboration of the Germans and the Ukrainians, shoulder to shoulder. They can't speak the same language, but they're pulling their tr the trigger and they're killing these um, Jewish families. The Ukrainians knew these Jews in the community because they were local Ukrainians. But the photographer who took this very clear image at close range, standing there in uniform, um, he was one of the guards uh, who was uh, in part of the occupation administration after the Nazis moved in, they brought in reinforcements from their Axis allies, Slovakians and Hungarians and uh, Romanians. And so he was drafted. Um, and deployed there and just found himself in this in this town. He did not want to be there, it turns out. He was a hobby photographer. As you said, the Leica, the Zeiss Icon, these are all coming into existence. They're patented in the 20s. They're hitting the consumer market in the 30s. Um, uh, by 1939, like 10% of the German population owned cameras. Um, the propaganda ministry, Goebbels, was telling everybody to, um, you know, document the triumph of, of of Nazism, including with their handheld cameras. Um, of course, they didn't want to document the mass crimes because they thought that would incite more resistance and rebellion. So that was a, a tricky uh, uh, policy to manage and, and there were contradictions there. But Skrovina, the name of the photographer, and here he is on the left, Lubimir Skrovina from um, Banska Bistrica, um, uh, Slovakia. Um, he was there on the scene with his camera. He was the company scribe um, and I went to check it out and he took this series of photos. The central image is the one that I just showed you, but that was his turning point. That was his enough moment. He took that image um, uh, to fight against what was happening and smuggled them out with the help of his wife. The two of them were um, resistance fighters together and showed those images to Jews back in Bratislava. He himself was interrogated by the kind of Gestapo-like authority in Bratislava. Um, was subjected to, to um, uh, some harsh treatment himself just for taking those images um, and ended up trying to rescue Jews and hide Jews in his attic. Um, one of them was an OBGYN and actually delivered his son, Lubimar Jr. in 1943. So that image, there's, you know, once you conduct that kind of research with all of these different um, tools we have at hand um, to do such research, one can find out a lot that in fact, um, the photographer was not 
a collaborator. It was a completely different kind of person and that that image had a different meaning for him and it set other things in motion, including um, acts of resistance. And, and do you think, I mean, you, you mentioned that this is one of the few photographs. I mean, you said this was his, his enough moment and this is one of the few photographs of, of genocide being committed in the act. Do you think there are more images like this to be uncovered? Um, certainly, yes. Uh, when you have millions of photographs um, being taken by ordinary soldiers and ordinary witnesses um, that all cannot be completely confiscated, when you have a culture of, um, in the Nazi system, for instance, of creating photo albums for your commander, your commandant, um, your uh, Stroop, the st when the Warsaw Ghetto was um, raised and, and the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto occurred in April 43, uh, the head of that campaign actually produced a photo album for Himmler to say, look, this was my good work to kind of show off his quote unquote achievement. This is happening also in the camps, the Lily Jacobs album, the Auschwitz album. We also have a new album that turned up of Sobibor, which shows Demjanjuk, um, um, hanging out with the German officials and, and um, had that photo album of Damianik been around during all of these trials and cases, you know, things, uh, the cases would have gone in a different direction. Um, so these photographs are around, that last album was found, I think, um, in under someone's kitchen sink in Germany. So they're around. Um, I would imagine that when some people discover them in their attics or under their sinks, um, if it's family members and they're um, complicit, um, then they may not survive those albums. A lot of them have been destroyed. Uh, so when they are uncovered, you know, of course, we want them to go to archives to do this kind of research, um, to write these histories, um, and to potentially research um, the victims as well. And the way that you, you know, we've kind of opened with this sort of puzzle piece, um, I think mirrors how you've written the book um, and you sort of organize the book around different kind of characters portrayed in the photograph. And, you know, you show, you know, very, I think adeptly how you combine a variety of sources, both documents and people um, to reach your conclusions. And in a sense, I guess this shows, you know, this is quite powerful commentary on the vast amounts of information we still don't know about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I just, wanted to zero in on something that we talked about actually before we, we went live um, on family history, um, which as you've said, plays a big part in this and especially um, talking about the photographer's family, um, and, but also the family as a kind of a unit uh, of measure of the destruction of genocide. So I just wanted to ask you a bit about the ethics of this kind of research and engaging with family histories or some might say living history um, and we've we've kind of marketed this event as an HDRP event, but also um, as part of the library's family histories of the Holocaust uh, series. So as a historian, how do you put yourself in the picture and uh, write yourself into the story? And how did you navigate the relationships with the families involved ethically and sensitively? Mm -hmm. Wow, lots of questions. Okay. So I'm um, just kind of writing these all down because there are various um, aspects of these questions. First is the historical kind of conceptual theme of the family um, in the history of, of genocide um, and in the history of the experience of genocide, choices that the victims have to make, um, the gendered elements of this, the family dynamics, uh, which, you know, once you start to look for that in the source material and the memoir literature and the testimony material, it's, it's pretty um, uh, striking and, and yeah, I mean, I, I could go on and on about that as far as survivors talking about their families and regrets and decisions that were made at the time uh, that were fateful. Um, or the ultimate horror. It, you know, if genocide is the crime of all crimes, isn't the ultimate horror um, dying with your family, being murdered with your family, seeing your, your, your children suffer um, and having your children see you suffer? And so much of this um, came out as we looked at other cases of genocide in the Congo and the way genocide heirs deliberately use this as another level of sadistic cruelty and torture um, at the same time um, with the goal of, of pure elimination, uh, root and branch of, of genealogically of, of so-called races or tribes. Um, uh, I mean, Hitler had said to uh, one of his allies, um, his Croatian ally in the summer of 41, when all of these big decisions were occurring and into the fall, uh, uh, that line had been crossed into physical de destruction of the Jews. Um, 
he said to him, you know, I, I, we cannot have one Jewish family uh, left on the continent of Europe uh, that, because the offspring will rise up and avenge. And he said, they always come back, even with the expulsions, they come back. So the genocide heirs were clearly, um, and the Nazis in particular, because of their um, biological genocide, uh, were constantly pursuing these kind of pro-natalist and anti-natalist policies. And this was kind of typical of the eugenics movement in this time. So that's that was important to me. And it hadn't really come up in the Lemkin work, Lemkin's work, the, um, the uh, Raphael Lemkin, who coined the term genocide and helped craft the convention in 48 that was passed. So it's kind of there in the indictments in Nuremberg, but not kind of front and center. And then after the war, there's a, uh, an emphasis on family as restoring the family, is restoring civilization and um, the family of nations. So I just was intrigued by that theme. Um, and also that the search for the missing is really driven by family members who have to continue, have to deal with these various agencies and how that intersects with like the bureaucratization of searching for missing and tracing services and that kind of disconnect between the deeply personal search for a loved one with the photograph. This is my child. This is my father. Have you seen this person? This kind of um, intense search. Um, the issue of working with um, family members themselves and, and, and being transparent in that process. First of all, in my book, I wanted to show how research is conducted and be um, show the subjectivities as well as the empirical kind of objective tools that we have and going into archives and analyzing documents. And that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a real person with my own um, bias or my own you know, decisions I make as I pursue this search and just be totally transparent about that um, and to engage people in, in how that research can be, can be conducted. So it could be instructive. Um, again, this book is also for my students too and graduate students. And uh, this is how you might wanna pursue your questions um, and, and these are the, the, the resources available, the kinds of archives, the kinds of ways that you can analyze documents. So I put myself in, this, in the story, kind of personal turn, um, because it was also uh, for me important to show like how research happens, what happens behind the scenes, how do we actually determine facts um, and find them and come to these um, and, and establish the truth of what happened. Um, because it's, it's not made up, <laughs> it's, it's based on a reality. Um, and dealing with the, the family itself was, I mean, I've always had incredibly, um, especially among the, um, within, within the victim community, um, embracing my work and, and supporting it and working together collaboratively in the best sense and trying to uncover more information and share whatever materials we have um, and not be afraid of that. Um, and, and just, it's a, it can be a very gratifying experience, especially because it's such difficult subject matter. So that helping one another uh, and discovering together. And I, I've gotten so many emails from families, Jewish uh, descendants of victims, those family members. And I wish I could respond to all of them. I, I promise I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, in time. And, and I, <laughs> I just, um, so that, that's been surprising Thing in many ways, that response um, from family members um, more than ever before, because that topic is in the book. Um, but it makes me realize too that this search, you know, had focused on the immediate post-war period, but it just continues, you know, across generations. This is a cross-generational, um, you know, we talk about memory across generations, but that search uh, for information is just it's there, it's like, a, it's like that open wound for those family members. And they'll never, I don't think be total closure because murder is, how can you kind of reconcile murder, right? Of a family member, um, that's, that's a big question. But this, this just this search for more information um, is, is part of that grieving and part of that kind of understanding that, that happens. And I appreciated that family members allowed me to participate in that with them. Thanks for that. I, I actually, I'm going to come back to that point. Um, and I, I didn't want to sort of stop you in the middle because it's such a compelling theme that runs throughout your book. Um, and, but you know, there are family, I wanted to mention too, that part of it's, it's not as prominent in the book, but I also was struck as well by the family trajectory. Um, and Levinas talks about 
the trajectory that happens in these kind of traumatic events that anyone who's on that scene gets kind of like their lives get kind of thrown off into all these directions. So I thought about that photograph as an event and that everyone in that photograph living or, or dead, murdered or, or who walked away from that scene, there's a, like a trajectory of that event that, that spins out kind of, um, including to me, right, with, the, with, with that photograph coming into my hands and acting on it. Like the, all the different forms of kind of agency that, 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 that project out of an event like that, that's so, um, so powerful. And so it's not just the victim's family, but, you know, dealing with the family, the photographers, you mentioned, trying to find the descendants of the perpetrators, going back to the town and trying to find the collaborators, families and talking to the families in Ukraine about what it's like to be there today. Could you, could you talk a little bit more about that process, actually, um, the research that you did on site. And I know in the book, you talk a little bit about, or not even more than a little bit about your work with Yahad and Unum and how, um, you know, that process of research is carried out in interviewing eyewitnesses and their descendants. I mean, that sort of picks up. And I'm, and I'm going to come back to the question of, you know, who the book is for, um, because you mentioned, you know, your students and, um, and it'll come back to this issue of, of looking again, but why don't we um, maybe go with this question first, just, just talking about how you did the research on site. Sure. Um, uh, so I'm going to move to a, next, a couple of slides just to give you a little visual of the town so you can see the place um, in, in more of the current current day. By the way, this is the photo, this is the uh, actual camera. And so I've got this next to the photographer. So we have our photographer. Here's the actual camera he used to take that picture, which he donated to a museum in Bratislava. And that got me in touch with the family. They had the he had come out at the end of his life. He died in 2005 and donated it and realized that that photograph and the camera, that that should be part of a, muse, a little exhibit on the Holocaust and was very clear and intentional in the letter when he donated it. So the fact that he came into kind of a public space like that allowed me to find him, not just through Facebook or whatever these kinds of tools, but um, uh, so I, I felt like I could contact the family because he had already made himself known and, and had that last wish, um, which we could, and there he is, in, there's our photographer. This is taken in Mirapol in a photo studio in Mirapol um, a few weeks. It's dated uh, a few weeks before in 1941. He's in the center there before the um, he took that photo of the massacre. And this is just German um, promotion of the handheld camera uh, at war to, to, to photograph the war as you're experiencing it. The optical panzer, you know. So Mirapol is in what is called the Pale of Settlement historically, the Jewish, uh, what the czars had set up as a kind of reservation, con you know, these were restricted, geographically restricting the Jews to this part of Ukraine. So when we talk about the Holocaust, um, victims of the Holocaust um, out in the Soviet Union, they're mostly victims from Ukraine, not Russia. Like one in four victims of the Holocaust uh, resided in what is the borders of Ukraine today. And here's the town that I visited um, a few times. This was the first time I went in Mirapol. This is the center of the town. Uh, rather, um, not the most lively place, um, which we can explain, um, and not you know as 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 the results of the Holocaust, in part as a result of the Holocaust, because of the loss of that Jewish community there, which used to be here in the center of town. This is the marketplace. looks looks pretty desolate. Um, this is a memorial to the Second World War here. Um, but this is about, you know, a, a century of Sovietization, Stalinization, a failed Soviet experiment. And then in the immediate uh, post-Soviet period, um, the struggles of Ukraine today um, uh, with um, the war with Russia, hyperinflation and whatnot. So it's um, a, a region that um, deserves our attention as far as its history and what it's struggling with today. This is how the Jews were forced to march in this direction from the marketplace to the forest nearby. Now, as I was doing this kind of groundwork on the groundwork, in a sense, trying to corroborate the photograph with the testimonies and the archives um, and their statements and whether they measured up with the actual proximities and the locations of the buildings and you know, the location of the murder site versus where the Jews resided in town. So that was part of my kind of on the ground investigation. And I, you know, I had been going to Ukraine since 1992. So I always, um, uh, you know, participated in that, like understood that my research was 
um, had a kind of anthropological element for better or for worse that I would go to those actual sites and try to um, talk to people on the ground. I mean, we're, you know, in the aftermath, there's all this talk of aftermath studies as if aftermath, you know, isn't in our lifetimes, but, you know, having worked on this, uh, really started studying this in the late eighties um, and then the Soviet Union collapse, you know, just seeing, you know, talking to perpetrators, talking to survivors, seeing the bullet holes um, <laughs> on the walls of buildings in Berlin and Munich, um, you can't disassociate ourselves. We can't separate ourselves. We are in. We are still in the history of an, a, an event of this magnitude. You know, the ripples. Um, uh, Ten years, twenty years, seventy years. It's it's in our lifetime. So, um, when Yahad and Unum, Patrick Dubois, the French priest who founded that organization, started doing work in Ukraine, and has ultimately discovered um, hundreds now. Uh, I think over two thousand different mass murder sites. Um, and plotting them systematically based on documentation and collecting testimonies from the Ukrainian witnesses who participated in these mass murders have been absolutely uh, really important for filling in that history that the documentation, where the documentation is missing. The Germans didn't care about when they told a Ukrainian girl to dig that pit. And I talked to a Ukrainian woman, now elderly woman who dug, was part of digging the pit in the photograph that we looked at. They, you know, and doing this in broad daylight, they didn't care that Ukrainians were brought in to do this horrific work and that this was going to be left in their hometowns and that they were killing their neighbors, you know, and create fomenting that violence. They, they just moved in, occupied, moved out. So, um, you know, that history was not documented um, in the German records. So the work that Father Dubois um, initiated, I um, supported um, and was an academic advisor as well. And we worked together on projects. And I decided I gave him, uh, gave his team all the material I had from the archives and the photos. And I was like, okay, let's do this. Let's go in into the field. Let me see how you actually conduct this kind of research. And we did, we, we, we used these Soviet records um, to go through here, so this is a, a investigation right after, or this is later in the war, or this is later actually, but um, the sketch of, of the Jews who were the arrow shows, that was a marketplace, they're being forced to walk down here and into the park, and here's the park where the uh, photograph uh, was taken, where the mass murder um, occurred. And this is part of the Soviet investigation. We have our Ukrainian collaborators. We caught up with them here. They're being fingerprinted. So it's pretty remarkable in terms of the pursuit of justice. The Ukrainians in the photograph were identified and convicted. And two of them were um, executed in 1987, only a few years before the collapse of the Soviet Union, only a few years before Ukraine got its independence. Um, for the record, the Germans um, were identified in a very perfunctory case in 1969, but the, there was no trial. It was just a kind of pro forma. Um, these are other images. That's the German case. I wanted to show you the picture that, um, we'll go back to that in a minute. This was the Yahad and Unum work. So we went into the field with this image um, of Jewish families, and we talked to the uh, Ukrainian witnesses and found out um, in town, who was there, who saw what, who did what. Um, and they just gave us their, their view of what happened. They didn't tell us, they didn't know the history of the Holocaust, the way that we studied academically and the different debates. And, you know, they just had their piece that they saw or they knew. And so it was a collection of kind of shards of memory that we had a piece together. Part of the work involved, uh, this, this young, this elderly man was a pet, young boy. He was working in the fields with, uh, grazing cows, heard the sounds, heard the screams, uh, ran over, and he's pointing now. Um, he could identify, describe the color of the German uniforms of the killers. I mean, it was incredible what memories they did have. Um, although they were very discreet, they were pretty solid. Um, here we are interviewing um, one of another witness whose father was um, working for the Germans, and they acquired or were given a Jewish house. Um, and she saw the uh, destruction of the, of the Jewish ghetto the night before. And here we're walking along that path, um, the Han Unum team and I, this is 2016, going into the forest um, to the site that is pictured in the photograph. Um, that's Andrea Monsky. And then we have a, a French filmmaker here and an interpreter. 
Um, and we went in and we realized as we got in there, and this is not the best image, but the landscape, as I mentioned before, the uh, kind of ecosystem, the uh, environmental history was very helpful as I read in forensic archeology, span how the displacement of soil in the digging of these pits, the decomposition of the victims, especially when they're clothed. And this just completely changes the landscape into kind of a moonscape. Um, it's just, you're standing there and you just say, whoa, this is, these are irregular kinds of you know, formations here. The vegetation is, is disrupted. And we just, you know, we were there and we um, were looking and walking around and realizing that this was the, the scene um, and moved the muck and found bones. We found uh, vertebrae, we found skull fragments. Um, and this is because when the Soviets investigated the case late in 86, 87, they um, needed the bones, the, the evidence of the victims as part of the case and did a very thorough exhumation, rather rough, sometimes using um, uh, trucks and, and kind of bulldozers. And this disrupted all the um, remains. And of course, raises the other question about the dignity of the burial um, and the right to have a proper burial and not to disrupt these remains according to Jewish law. Well, this, I mean, this comes back to something that you, you just mentioned about this, um, forensic turn in Holocaust studies. And um, obviously I, I wonder if you could sort of comment on the strengths and weaknesses of this approach. And, and if you think, you know, your book sort of, you know, promotes this interdisciplinary approach to Holocaust studies. You mentioned the, you know, the ecology and now, and, and this sort of forensic aspect. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more on that. Yeah, I mean, we have forensic, um, advances in forensic archaeology, Catherine Powell's work, um, and of course, Carolyn Sturdy Cole's work on some of the actual sites like Treblinka and working on the Channel Islands. And it raises all kinds of challenges, not only about um, religious law and disruption of human remains and souls, <laughs> um, but it, it's also about those localities and um, those communities. And do they want people kind of digging around and doing this kind of, kind of research? And what is to be gleaned? Like, why are you doing this 50 years, 60, 70 years on? Um, first of all, a lot of this came out of genocide um, studies uh, who, where we see the use of aerial photography and the identification of scarring landscapes to uh, help us find, for instance, where there are mass graves in Northern Iraq and, and in the pursuit of, on behalf of the Yazidi. Um, so we, these are happening, or you, we mentioned um, Srebrenica earlier and the search for the missing there and the fact that the um, genocide errors in that case, um, Milosevic and company, they were very deliberate in their massacres um, uh, um, against the Muslim po population, the Bosnian Muslims, of at bringing in bulldozers like this to dismember the victims, to make them um, unrecognizable. I mean, they were so keen on not on, on working against the identification of victims, that the, 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 the victims' remains were strewn in different locations and had to be, you know, literally pieced back together. So um, that uh, challenge that was faced in the 90s then generated more work on um, what can, how can we do this, this kind of um, uh, uh, identification work um, and the importance of forensic ar archaeology. So that's important for today. Um, uh, as the crimes are happening um, and to quickly go in and, and identify them and get the world on alert, uh, get the ICC in motion, get the, you know, the, the, the prevention regime that we've developed has that technical kind of forensic part piece to it. And so I just kind of took that and tried to see to what extent um, it could be uh, provide more information on this crime from 70 years ago. And that can, and these tools are being used in, in looking at the history of um, persecution of African-Americans and slavery here in the United States and finding human remains, um, history of lynching. Um, I, and I, I, you know, um, I think whatever, you know, one argument in the book is whatever tools you have available to you um, in the pursuit of, of, of knowledge, you know, uh, one should, um, involve and, 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 and turn to others. I mean, I turn to the experts at different agencies, whether it's ballistics or forensic archeology span at the Smithsonian institutions, you know, to reach out. It's a community really 
it's a collective crime and it's a community that it takes in some ways to solve it, to work on it and to um, pursue some sort of redress justice and also repair for the families. Thanks, Wendy. It's, I mean, it's obviously a, a strong case for working collaboratively with, with others. Um, and it's, it's quite a remarkable amount of information that you were able to pull from this single photograph. Um, I just want to come back to you know, before we, I see that there's some questions coming in and I, I'd like to turn to those uh, very soon. Um, I just want to come back to one other point um, that you were talking about before about kind of the political nature of, of tracing work and you know, this sort of categorization of, of individuals as categories. And, you know, we sort of talked about this before in, in our email conversations and our pre-conversation about Jenny Edkins' work um, on the missing. Mm -hmm. Um, and you talk about the missing missing, um, or as Jenny Edkins calls this, un unmissed person. So in other words, people who were murdered and who are missing and who have no family or descendants mm -hmm. and there are no eyewitnesses um, searching for them. And she, in her book, has this um, quote about um, photographs, you know, sort of uh, you know, sometimes being the only thing that's left. Um, as she says, sometimes all that's left to insist that a person was indeed once there is a photograph Photographs challenge the traumatic disruption of time and place. They make the missing visible, but photographs themselves are ambiguous at once present as objects, yet inevitably records of an absence. Um, so I wanted to just sort of end my kind of questions to you um, by asking if, how, how do you think this sort of search for the missing shapes our understanding of the history of the period? Who, who counts among the missing of the Holocaust? You referred a bit earlier um, to gaps in the evidence. Um, and so, for example, in German evidence, um, which would never have accounted for the Ukrainian girls who were forced to, to dig these mm. pits. So how, you know, how does that, you know, who's being searched for shape what we know about the Holocaust? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, Cause there are all these absences and kind of blind spots um, missing pieces, gaps, um, silences, taboos, all of this is lurking there um, in all these histories because, you know, you, you talked about why you write yourself into it, because of our own, in a way, subjectivity, um, our own bias, and also because you have kind of various disconnects, which is really clear in Edkin's book as far as the search for missing that has to um, the energy it takes to continually search for a, a person who loses a loved one, a, a parent or a child, and walks around with that photograph um, and is determined as ever, and, but then has to confront all these agencies and these bureaucracies, which are not prepared to really respond to that, but to deal not with people as individuals, but as statistics, and especially because these are massive crimes. And um, so it's, it was hard even for these tracing services, and it's fantastic that the ITS continues to really do this. This is part of their mission based on that huge archive. Um, but you can even see in the history of the Holocaust and, and how that, you know, people grow weary of those who are conducting these searches. Like, okay, you know, I mean, there's always this kind of um, inclination to move on, you know, and, and, um, and that's part of the Edkins book as well. And why is, why is that the move on? Is it, she would argue, you know, there's, there's shame kind of associated with these histories as far as what we realize we're capable of doing and what happens and there's guilt and maybe we're complicit in some way and it's just kind of like these tendencies to suppress and obviously the genocide heirs are you know they promote that entirely and they're deliberately erasing the traces and obfuscating and impeding these kinds of in investigations um so that's you know this these kinds of efforts um the more memorialization, obviously, every year and the rituals, but um, this I, I see this kind of research as a way of um, resistance of, of of working against that um, of that suppression of the missing missing, and when you're open to um, that kind of investigation, um, you're also open to finding out new information about the Holocaust as far as who those missing are. Um, my photograph um, featured this would turn out to be a Jewish family. Um, but of course, in that process, you know, um, you discover uh, other communities that are victimized that haven't been accounted for in the history. A lot of the 
women I interviewed in Ukraine or, or read their testimony in the late 80s who were peasant girls um, during the occupation, like their entire uh, wartime experience as far as what they were subjected to on, on the part of the, um, the Germans, whether it was sexual violence, um, some of the worst labor uh, because the, most of the able-bodied men had evacuated the Red Army or they were put into service in the police. Um, and you know, they're digging these pits and forcing to, you know, feeding the Germans and picking up the remains of the victims um, uh, during these massacres and, and gathering them, um, you know, forced to climb trees to actually, you know, it, because limbs and it just, what they witnessed and went through, I mean, that was another piece of, oh, that's just, just I wouldn't have, um, didn't realize that um, as, as, as much as I had in the past in my prior research. I mean, I knew they were forced laborers, Ostarbeiter, but what is that forced labor? What are they actually being forced to do? And I just, some of it was just incredibly um, gruesome. And they were brave when they, in the late eighties, when the KGB came and they were um, speaking about what happened or when I went to visit and um, they, respond to me so graciously and drove me to different sites and, and were so hospitable and said, we want to help you too. And, um, and you know, that's, that's another missing piece. They're not missing people per se, but it's just how these, uh, if we're open to this pursuit, how those untold stories um, of others who were victimized by this terrible war, how that, how that comes out in the process. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to turn now to, there's a lot of questions coming in um, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, the first one, we're gonna go back actually to very specifically to the photograph. Um, Ed Westerman's asking um, about, you mentioned uh, ballistics uh, before. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, by the so, way, sorry, I wanna go, I'm gonna take this. This is just the uh, illustration very quickly of the shoes, something I found really very, uh, Awesome, actually, Bella Liebman took this picture and this was used in a case in Toronto against some um, Hungarian police, uh, some gendarmes. These are women um, in Shiged, uh, Hungary, Western Ukraine, who are searching for their, uh, the deportees, Jews who had been deported. This is what's left of the Jewish community. These talk about the material culture piece mm. of this, going through looking for the identifying features like that the shoes were used, not just symbolically, but actually used to identify victims, I thought was incredible. Yes, and you tie that really mm -hmm. remarkably to that part of the image. Um, and you sort of talking about the, the man who used one foot to sort of removed, remove the shoe um, before he was killed. Um, so back to Ed's question, um, he's asking, um, he said that he was struck by the close proximity of the killers to their victims. And there's another question a bit later on about this um, that talks about kind of the spatial nature of this murder scene. Um, he notes that there are at least six visible shell casings indicating the killings have been in progress. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insights on these aspects of the photo? Quite a sharp eye. Yeah, um, this was something I started to uh, look at more closely. I shared this photograph with um, a dear colleague who passed last year, Jeff McGargy, who was at the museum, a specialist on um, the history of the Holocaust, specifically on the role of the military and the military history. And um, uh, he was describing to me, and he himself um, had gone through the military and, and was describing the, the postures as they're, how, how they're holding the gun and what's going on and, and their positioning of their feet. Um, and then um, after he died, I started to think about following up on that more. And, um, and I reached out to a, a district attorney's office and a ballistics person um, uh, about a year and a half ago, who's then started to describe to me what's going on with this smoke. Because why is there kind of a halo uh, kind of a, you know, this, this opening here. And so he described to me that these, um, that the victims were brought to the edge of the pit and shot so quickly, one after the other. And there you can see the casings as far as other shots that have been fired and perhaps, it, you know, um, murdered. These are the, the, the casings from the, the bullets of this victim, actually, it went to this victim. Shot uh, that one after the other, that the multiple muzzle blasts produced halos of smoke that are still hovering in the atmosphere. 
Um, and that was how he explained that to me, this, this kind of phenomenon. So that it's part of, you know, a massacre that it's, there were victims before, and this is why it's hovering there. And then the, the, the next blast goes through and it opens up that, um, that space, um, but then that hovers. So I don't know if this is the smoke, you know, it could very well be, it is the smoke from the previous victims. And if, um, they're you know, about to fire at this moment. Um, so the sequencing there, um, uh, I could not, you know, tell you with, with more precision, but it, the smoke does um, indicate that they're not the only victims and obviously the casings uh, on the ground as well. And if Ed wants to add to that, I would be curious to, to learn from him as well. Thanks, Wendy. I'm just gonna turn um, in the meantime, if, if Ed wants to add something, um, to a couple questions about justice. Um, and Rachel's asking about um, whether the German perpetrators were still alive when they were identified in the 60s. Um, and I know you mentioned that they, that there was just a sort of pro forma um, sort of reckoning. And then yeah. another a person, um, Janice asks, why did they um, escape trial? Doesn't the photograph constitute evidence of complicity in murder? So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this is the file. Um, my colleague Andrea Monsky helped me find this in Ludwigsburg. This is a kind of archive, now a German federal archive in Stuttgart, where these post war West German investigation records are um, uh, collected, and one can go there and conduct research there. It's a good archive. Um, and so, what happened was very quickly, I, I figured out that the killers were not regular police, order police, or, or regular German soldiers or SS. Um, I studied their insignia and I uh, really could, I couldn't quite figure out what unit they were, but they weren't um, what we would typically think of as like Einsatzgruppen, and the kind of main killers, um, shooters uh, in, the, in the Holocaust by bullets, as it's called. And remarkably, the photographer, very clever um, and very observant, <laughs> he mentioned uh, in one of his uh, interrogations that the Germans were finance guards. And that was just, that was fantastic because it was so specific. So then I realized um, that there were these finance guards from the finance ministry, kind of customs guards who were supposed to be like checking packages at the railway station or the post office, that they, there was a unit stationed in Mirapold in October, 1941. Um, but those records are, were largely destroyed at the end of the war. They were uh, in, in Berlin in 1945. I, I looked into it and so forth, went to the archives. Um, all we had is this little file um, from 1969. It's only about 50 pages. Um, and it turned out that one of the men who was among the Germans, um, but not pictured in the photograph, uh, as a uh, retiree, went into his local police station in this little town called Lotzen near Hanover. And this is the police report. Um, so the, the policeman at the desk that evening, because it was a January, uh, 1969 evening, this, this the former customs guard walked in and said, I want to report a crime. And this is 1969. <laughs> and so this is the sheet. I want to report a crime. It occurred in Mirapol. You can see you mis misplaced it in Russia in 1941. The victims are Jewish and Russian people. I don't know who they are, Umbakant, and starts to describe uh, the massacre and then identifies these two killers, Kuska and Voigt. Um, who volunteer. That was an all volunteer killing squad in that photograph that uh, Ukrainians and the Germans. And so we, we learned that um, uh, these German officials were playing cards on a Sunday night, playing Scott, and an SS man came in and said, why are there Jews in this town? And uh, they need to be gone, you know, tomorrow. And who's going to carry this out? Uh, and these guys volunteered, Yavol. They stood up and said, yes, uh, and wholeheartedly, this they saw as an opportunity because they were in their unit. They were known to be uh, kind of rabid anti-Semites and and violent, had violent tendencies. So um, they there they went, um, and and we have them in that photograph. So um, the investigation, as I mentioned, just uh, really didn't go anywhere. It was good in terms of collecting more testimonies because some of their comrades were more forthcoming. But it was great to compare it with the photograph and just see how. 
it was riddled with all kinds of um, perjurious statements and deflection and diversions. And so for analyzing perpetrator testimony and all the tricks of defense um, and obfuscation, it was it was quite um, helpful to to have that and compare it with the photograph. Um, but at the in the end, one of the killers couldn't be find um, near uh, couldn't be found. Sorry, near Bremen, um, and the other one um, just lied his way out of um, any further uh, uh, investigation. They just shelved it after a year. They they actually denounced the gentleman who um, uh, came in initially and started this investigation. They said that he was unstable and had psychological problems and he was just seeking revenge against his comrade for personal reasons. Thanks, Wendy. Um, I, there was actually a question about that specific, I think that some of the elements um, in Paul's uh, question about um, you know this, this photo sh showing this kind of limited numbers of victims in this particular photo, lack of people to take part in the shooting, you know, what sort of dictated the kind of spatial arrangement of this photo. And I think you know, that, that testimony kind of helps Give give shed more light on the particular circumstances of this um, of this massacre, um, and I just maybe I close with this question from Carol um, about Ludmila Blackman who crawled mm -hmm. out of the pit. So she was wondering if you could say a bit more about her testimony. Mm. Well, um, unfortunately, I did not get to meet Ludmila. She died in two thousand fifteen in Israel. Uh, she participated in the trial in 1986-87. Um, her testimony is probably one of the most valuable uh, accounts of a Jewish survivor from Ukraine, period. Uh, and it happened to be a miracle. I had been using it before um, in another book I wrote or edited a diary and in my other work. Um, so it's, it's something that if you're interested in this history, um, these, you know, the survival rates in these in these formal shtetls, you know, less than one percent, less than two percent, is completely obliterated. And her story, the odyssey that she went through, it, it, it's really miraculous. Um, and so, and the way she describes her experiences, the the vivid uh, details, the memories of of statements that her father said to her, the warnings he gave her, her siblings. Um, the, the scenery that, you know, not everybody has that kind of a memory um, or can articulate it that way. And um, it's such a powerful testimony. Someone wrote to me recently, said they, they might want to even do a book about it or even a, a little a, a documentary or something about it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I had, it was so rich with uh, imagery and with detail, I integrated it as much as possible. And it was really all I had as far as a voice since I couldn't ultimately determine with certainty the names of the family um, in the photograph, but but Ludmilla, you know, was in some ways helping me kind of represent that community through her voice and and sadly, you know, the only voice. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think we've actually reached the end of our of our allotted time. Um, I wanted to thank you for answering these questions and for taking in questions from the audience. I think, you know, overall your book, it, it's a, it's such a remarkable feat of research and, and as you said, research as memorialization, it also kind of overturns this idea that, you know, the Holocaust was an industrial killing process. We see this evidence very starkly portrayed. Um, it's just been a pleasure speaking with you about it, even if obviously the topic is quite heavy. Um, so thank you for doing this uh, for us. Um, and I'm gonna hand back to Imogen um, who will close out our event. Thank you, Christine. Um, there's not really left, uh, not really much left for me to say, sorry. I would just say that uh, the ravine has been published in the UK and the US and I'm sure um, in other places for our other international audience members um, in hardback and will be out in paperback later this year. I would just like to say thank you to Professor Lauer for uh, her time and sharing this important and fascinating work. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Dr. Schmidt, for, um, for chairing this event, for asking the questions, and of course to our audience for all your questions, your comments, and also your time. And we hope to see you at a future HGRP event. So take care, everyone, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Christine.